What's up, everyone? Thanks for stopping by for another video. Today, we're going to talk about the worst f***ing advice that I've heard throughout my 18-year career. So I guess it's time to start a little drama. Let's go. So everyone is giving advice these days. It's like it's like the cool in thing to do. I think Gary V maybe kicked this off more than anyone else where it became cool to be motivational and to be inspiring. And and that is what people aspired to be was be inspiring. And I think most people really mean good. I think most people that have said the things that I'm going to talk about in this video, they do really mean good. They're trying to inspire, they're trying to help. It's not malicious in any way doesn't make them right. And here on YouTube, this stuff is just absolutely out of control because anyone with a decent camera and some decent lights uh, can look like they should be paid attention to. But just because someone knows how to edit video real slick and has a YouTube channel, and even if they have a ton of followers and subscribers, it doesn't mean what they're saying is correct. So today we're gonna talk about some of the most absurd things I've heard throughout my career. Here we go. STEM mastering. Number one, STEM mastering. Now for those of you that don't know, STEM mastering is when you would send a drum stem and a guitar stem and a bass stem and a keys stem and a vocal stem and whatever, all separated out to your mastering engineer. They call this STEM mastering. So normal mastering, you would just send uh, a left and right, a stereo track, just the mix. That's what you send to a mastering engineer. But there's this new fad called STEM mastering. And uh, this is nonsense. The idea that a mastering engineer would rebalance the elements within my mix because I apparently don't know what I'm doing or, or because I didn't mix it good enough, like that's crazy. If your mastering engineer is requesting stems and, and won't master a regular stereo two track, fire them and get someone else. <laughs> we might as well just get right into the drama of it. If your mastering engineer won't master without stems, Get rid of them, get someone else. Because that's not a real mastering engineer. STEM mastering is not mastering. STEM mastering is mixing. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't pay somebody to do this for you. I'm not saying that you shouldn't send your stems to someone and have them finish your mix for you. But you should not do it under the assumption that this is mastering, because it's not. You're paying somebody to finish your mix. STEM mastering is not mastering. On to the next one. So this one is pretty perplexing to me. This next one is called white noise mixing or pink noise mixing. And the the idea is that you would put a white noise signal generator or a pink noise signal generator. I'm actually not sure which is the preferred method in this uh, nonsense snake oil BS. But you would put this in your song while you're mixing and then you would listen to the pink noise, like loud, like so it covers up most instruments. <laughs> and then that would allow you to just poke out like you want your vo vocals the loudest thing in the mix. You would put a pink noise generator in that is loud enough to cover everything else up in the mix and then you'd be able to poke your vocals out the top of that pink noise and then that means that your mix is great. Man, this is absolutely insane to me. There are no shortcuts in this. There's no shortcuts in mixing. There's no shortcuts in audio production. There's no shortcuts in life. If you want the things that the big pros are getting, then you have to do the things the big pros are doing 99% of the time. White noise is a is a attempt at letting you mix better when you should be focusing on acoustic treatment and a better monitoring environment and then turn your monitors down super, super, super quiet. Like, like really quiet, like where someone typing on a keyboard would be too loud for you to hear it, and then you can make those adjustments instead of using this white noise, because white noise, don't, don't do that. The next thing that I've heard over and over and over is always do X. So like I've heard people like always cut 200 in a kick drum, always put a high shelf on a vocal, always whatever. Let's actually talk about that in one second. Who should you take advice from? I think this is probably the most important part of this conversation is who should you take advice from and how do you know if they're full of shit or not? Well, when it comes to the technical side of music and music production, uh, engineering and mixing and mastering, and honestly the creative side as well, songwriting and like uh, their tastes within things, at the very, very, very least, you should have heard many, many songs that this person has worked on, and you should like it. You should be aspiring to do that same thing. 
Because if you don't like the music that they've done and that they've worked on, and or at least you don't respect its quality, why in the hell would you take advice from that person? Like, make sure, dig in before you take advice from someone, myself included. A lot of you watch the channel. And by the way, thank you guys all for watching and supporting the channel and subscribing and all that stuff. It, it means a lot to me. But most of you guys, like some of these mixed tutorials that I've got, have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views. And that's awesome. Uh, I believe in what I'm saying. I don't think I'm full of shit. But you should go to my website. I'll put a link in the description. You should go to my website and you should listen to my work. I work on, I've worked on over 150 songs a year for many, many years in a row. But if you don't like the work that I do, then you should probably not pay attention to what I have to say about it. And so before you take someone's advice as gold, check into them. Uh, make sure you like what they do. Now when it comes to a career in music or a career in mixing in the studio or whatever, you should make sure that the person you're taking advice from, if you're taking business advice or career advice, you should make sure that they are actually successful. Like really actually genuinely successful at what they do. Because if they're not genuinely successful, then you shouldn't be taking career advice from them anyway. Okay, back to 200 hertz on a kick drum. Now, I recently did a video called Frequencies I Hate, a mixed tutorial. It was my last video, actually, and I'll link it down below. Now, in this video, I was extremely careful not to tell you guys to always cut whatever. Like, I talked about disliking 2.5 to 3K on guitars, but that doesn't mean that I always cut 2.5 or 3K on guitars. What that means is I always pay attention to that frequency to see if I should cut it. And so anyone who says you should always do X, uh, you need to throw that out like right away. That's not someone that you want to listen to. That kind of leads me into my next one, which is you should always cut EQ and you should never boost. This is one of the most mind blowing things that came out of my magic is in the mid range video is the quantity of people that said that I shouldn't have been boosting EQ. I should only be cutting. You should never boost. You should only cut with EQ. <laughs> That's so crazy to me. So I did an entire other video called Boosting Versus Cutting EQ, where I dug into the history of where this came from and whether or not it's true, and I'll link that video down below. But the myth, the idea, the concept that you should only cut EQ, stop it, don't, don't listen to those people. This next one is extremely common, and I've heard this said hundreds of times over my 18 year career, and this is that you should only compress something a couple dB, or you shouldn't compress. You shouldn't compress a vocal, or you should only compress something a couple dB. I've heard both of those arguments a ton of times, and that is complete bullshit. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should go out and you should slam a vocal on every song that you work on. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is as a rule, as, as an actual rule, the, f the idea that you would never compress something or that you would never compress something more than a couple dB, that's crazy. By the time I'm done with a song, if I've tracked the vocals myself, if I was the tracking engineer and the producer and the mixer, a vocal in my productions, especially a dense, heavier, thicker production, will commonly get 40, 40 dB of compression. That's, that's a lot of compression. I'm happy to admit that that's a lot of compression. And it's not like I just slam a vocal with 40 dB of compression. I'm very, very strategic and I've built up this, this uh, system over many, many, many years and thousands of songs, actually thousands of songs that I've worked on. And so I track with a very specific compressor that allows me to get a compression level that I like to make the vocal sound the way that I want. I'm not compressing just for the sake of compressing. I'm trying to get to a finish line, a place that I have in my head and I want what's in my head to come out the speakers and I've chosen multiple compressors in multiple different stages throughout the process, tracking and mixing, uh, that gets me to the thing that I have in my head, the sound that I have in my head. And so I don't want you to just go out and just compress the hell out of something, but anyone who says that you shouldn't compress or you shouldn't compress more than X amount of dB, don't listen to them. Just just turn it off, turn it off. The next one is that Spotify turns your masters down to minus 14 dB LUFS. So you should only master at 14 dB, minus 14 dB LUFS. Your masters should be nice and quiet because Spotify is gonna turn it down anyway. And you don't want your song to sound quieter than everyone else's. So don't master loud. This 
is complete BS. And let me tell you how I know that this is complete BS. When this first started getting passed around and Spotify uh, announced that they would be turning everyone down to minus 14 dB LUFS, it made perfect sense to me. Oh, well, I should not master louder than that because if I'm smashing a song to be louder than minus 14 dB and then Spotify turns it down, it is going to sound smaller and quieter than everyone else that it's it's being played next to. I fully bought into this. And this was years ago, obviously, at this point. And so I mastered, I master a ton of songs. I end up mastering most of everything that I work on. So again, 150 songs a year plus that I'm mastering that get released, all of them get released. And so I'm constantly being able to play around with this and keep up with what's the best and what's not the best because I can check 150 songs a year and see how they sound on Spotify and on Apple Music. So back in the day when this first started getting passed around, I mastered a handful of songs, like probably five, six, seven songs at this minus 14 dB LUFS. And then they got released and I'm like, oh my God, why why is this so much quieter? Why is this so much quieter than everything else? What happened? Well, what happened is no one else is mastering at minus 14 dB LUFS, and it does actually make a difference regardless of what Spotify turns it down to. Now, I'm not gonna get all nerdy and technical on this. There are probably some other mastering engineers out there uh, that have videos on this, so I'm not gonna get too deep into this. The point that I want to make is when people tell you to master at minus 14 dB LUFS because that's what Spotify Spotify turns it down to, they are they're wrong. Don't don't listen to them. What you should do when you're mastering, in my opinion, is you should master to what's appropriate for the song. Every song that I master, what I want is the song to sound how I think it should sound. Now I I like compression, I like limiting, I like loud things. So most of the stuff that I work on, it gets a little loud before I enjoy the way that it sounds. And so what I'm going after when I'm mastering a song is not a target dB level, although I do pay attention to it. I'm going after what it sounds like, the sonic characteristics of it. Is it does it have enough energy? Is it aggressive enough? Is it smooth enough? Is it soft enough? Whatever is appropriate for the song, that's what I'm doing. And then when you're mastering, little side tip for those of you that that get into mastering when you're mastering more than one song that will be released together as a package an EP or an album you want to make sure these songs play together and so while I might master a hard rock song and and as a single and smash it pretty hard because I want all that energy out of it if it's next to a piano vocal ballad on the same album I've got to make those fit. Those have to sound right next to each other. So the album master might not be quite as smashed or quite as loud as the single master. Point is, don't master at minus 14 dB LUFS because you heard someone say that Spotify is going to turn it down because your song will be quieter than everyone else's. And simultaneously, don't smash the shit out of it to make it as loud as humanly possible because that's not the right move either. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this helped you. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope I didn't stir up too much drama. Uh, don't forget to click a like and drop me a comment and uh, subscribe if you haven't yet. I'd love it if you would subscribe and hit the bell icon next to the subscribe tab and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.